Sonic Talk. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sonic Talk, episode 545, recorded today live on Wednesday, the 15th of August. This is the podcast to do with music technology, synthesizers, software, all that kinds of stuff, controllers, uh, analog synthesizers, software synthesizers. Um, I, I think I've covered it all, live production, whatever we can we can dream up to fill our uh, fill our time here. The last the show lasts about an hour if you've not seen it before. And if you like what you see, please do subscribe on YouTube uh, and you'll get notifications every time we go live. We've also got lots and lots of other content. In fact, I published an extremely long Profit X uh, review yesterday, which was nearly 40 minutes. But because I was doing the samples and the synthesis, there's just so much to cover. So, And I'm sure I miss some stuff anyway. But if you like that sort of thing, do check out the channel, sonicstate.com. I want to say hello to our YouTube chatties. Uh, there they all are. For, uh, if you want to join that, uh, basically just go to YouTube and you can join the YouTube stream chat. We've also got our own little IRC, or we will have when I've got it plugged in, which I probably should do now, uh, which which is um, uh, where the IRC is, right? That's that's thrown me. Now I've got to actually try and find out where that window is and fix it. That's a bit annoying. There it is. Right, I'm going to fix it now. This is a bit of the, you can tell this is live because nothing's working. Change <laughs> desktop capture. Yeah, I want that. So that should do it now. So now we should have. Uh, IRC, there we go, IRC chatties, which can be found at sonicstate.com forward slash live. Phew, that was pretty painless. Anyway, uh, welcome one and all. Uh, say hello to our panellists. Uh, we've got, uh, we'll start with, oh, let's start with Mr. Yoad Nevo, who we haven't seen for a little while. Yoad's uh, there in his uh, excellent facility in London where he produces, mixes, writes, uh, also is a developer for Waves, working on a new big thing, which one day he'll be able to tell us what it is, I'm sure. And that every time we ask him, that day gets even closer. How are you, Yoad? Yeah, I'm very well. Yeah, still working on that big thing. Um, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Actually involved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah nothing to say. Nothing more to say about that. I, You know, I think I've said it so many... I, I've said it so many times, but just wait and see. Yeah, hopefully it will be worth the, the wait. I think it will. I'm sure it will. It's funny. We've been through this cycle before because uh, we used to have these conversations with Dave Spears when he'd be working on the thing. And very early on, because he's been with us for such a long time, very early on, he, he, he realized that it's not a good idea to say anything until you're basically having mm -hmm. the ink the box is inked, or yeah, as you would do in those days. So yeah, exactly. uh, wise, wise move, Yoad. <laughs> anyway. Absolutely. Anyway, lovely to have you aboard. And uh, we've also got Mr. Steve Hillier, who we haven't had a chance to see yet. Last time we tried to get him hooked up uh, from uh, Spain, but the local internet just wasn't quite up to scratch. How are you, Steve? Yeah, I, I'm very good, thank you. It was a real shame. I thought it was it was going to be fun. The, um, the fibre optic to our, our place down there, uh, we'd switched off and not and sort of left the house for a few weeks and when we came back we forgot to switch it on and it was like a it just meant that the only way we could do the connection was through my mobile phone which also meant that i had to be outside so i was thinking this is going to look great this is we'll have the mediterranean we'll have the sunshine uh unfortunately we didn't have the data so it didn't happen yeah oh, well. well so often it's the little things that tend to uh, <laughs> yeah. stymie yeah. Our, our technology these days i mean that's just the way it goes anyway because steve hillier uh educator producer dj songwriter um a man of many talents and uh what have you been doing anyway uh, uh, holidaying or working down there uh, no 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 um no there's a big writing uh project that i'm finishing i've got a for the first time in a while on a on a actual writing project uh i've got a deadline which is next wednesday so i've been uh collaborating with some people down uh, first of all in montpellier in france which was amazing actually i yeah. love it there i thoroughly recommend a, a trip there um and then also uh, back in brighton but then down in spain as well which is why i was down there and um yes yeah, so it's all going to be done by next wednesday and i discovered last night I, I, i'm sure like most of the writers here would have had an experience like this that there was one piece that i thought was the, the best piece of all so i played it to somebody else it's something i've done on my own only to discover that i'd kind of sailed off into the sunset creatively and sort of lost the plot but in a nice way so now i've got to come up with something completely new tonight to get to a singer tomorrow morning uh to have the whole thing completed next wednesday so yeah i'm keeping calm black coffee I, yeah well sometimes those creative deadlines can yield 
fascinating results because you just have to instinctively do what you instinctively do. At least that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so good luck with that. <laughs> and you. also we've got Mr. Charles Chicky Reeves, who's back in the UK. Ah, there's his Matrix Brute. Loud and proud. I'm, I'm a bit disappointed that you haven't got a message programmed in LEDs on there, Charles. Oh, I know like your time does. is. I know your time is valuable, but I mean, sometime you've got to prioritize things for things like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I, I do. I do love that thing. I should. I should program something like that. Oh, and I have my new toy here, my new Rev Two, which I bought oh, nice. after watching your review about it. I decided um, that's what I needed. <laughs> and how are you finding it? uh i find it it's just right there it's really easy to find no, it's, sorry, okay. that's, a, that's an american joke uh I, I love it i love it i didn't think i would like it because i haven't really liked other dave smith stuff i mean i think it's great it's just not really been my thing but i love this it sounds fantastic <laughs> it's just there is there like, is yeah there is a certain something about it i think yeah yeah it's it's about it's got a very special sound and i find the two of these together uh with the op1 and the mini log you know it's just a it's a nice and the organelle it's a nice combination of textures and I'm, I'm working on a soundtrack which actually this reminds me of something was just mentioned so i i'm working on this soundtrack thing doing this science fiction thing and um so i was really happy i like really broke through got something really creatively done and then i, I just on a lark at the end of the night I decided, oh, I'm going to listen to something just to cleanse the palate. And I put on the Blade Runner, the new Blade Runner soundtrack. And I was like, oh, my God, I just blatantly ripped off several major pieces from this without realizing it. Oh, wow. It's like, so I had to strike the whole thing and start all over. But I like what I did in the end anyway. But it's like, ah, oh, it's so frustrating. I hadn't heard the soundtrack in a while. And I guess I kind of had forgotten because the melodies are so simple. It's that Hans Zimmer thing of using two or three notes to make a melody. And that's it. And, uh, and I'd done something kind of like that. And then I realized that is <laughs> the same key. It's the same intervals in the same order. It's like, uh, so I'll start over. But, well, yeah, to be fair, if it's only three notes, the probabilities are fairly high that it's going to resemble yeah. something else. So, I mean, yeah, Absolutely. I, I, I will try and uh, I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure you can recycle it and use it somewhere else where perhaps it's not for a client. You never know. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, that's what I'm on. That's, oh, that's well, glad to hear it. That sounds really fascinating. Right. OK, well, we're going to start with a bit of fun. And this might link into uh, our initial discussions, actually. So, uh, oh, I did want to say, um, obviously, Isotope are sponsoring the show with a prize. Uh, you can win Vocal Synth 2 a little bit later on. Uh, should come up about halfway through the show. So please stay, stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, let's have a listen to this, if you can take it. This is the 1969... IHOP commercial, that's International House of Pancakes for those who perhaps aren't stateside. With a nuclear family running across fields with balloons for some reason. And the thing that's quite interesting about this is, is the fact that it's actually fairly heavily synthesised. Of course it says pancakes on the outside. But so, and the reason this came up now, this is this is a I know this is fairly random. Uh, I've been experimenting with some kind of more challenging headline types this week, and uh, I think my headline for this was uh, this 99, 1969 IHOP. Uh, was it fe featured nineteen sixty nine IHOP that uh, featured modular synths, but it's still horrible. And and there are, <laughs> and there are, I, I know that's perhaps a little unfair, but I mean, but judging by today's standards, yes, it's perhaps a little bit kind of like uh, ooh. And there, there's been all sorts of reactions. The reason this came out is Mark Doty or Automatic Gainsay, his alter ego on Facebook, uh, just said, you know, there's so few of these instruments around in 1969. There must have been only three or four people who probably did it, but it, we, we we don't know who it was and why. And, it, and I guess, you know, it's very forward thinking of uh, IHOP to actually utilise these sort of instruments on what is a kind of family mainstream commercial. So, you know, it, the, in terms of in terms of the kind of creative behind it, it's actually got lots of things going for it. The, the end result by today's standards is perhaps a little grating and a bit cheesy, but using a lot of cutting edge things. So, first of all, I suppose... I. I Mark, Mark was saying that he thought maybe it was a, a modular, and I suppose 1969, a Moog modular was probably what it would have been. I don't know whether that's uh, uh, whether that's true or not. A I mean, would anybody maybe. know that? Do you think a book? Yeah. Oh, that would be ironic, wouldn't it? That would be really ironic, as Buchler yeah. obviously um, was much more into less mainstream. <laughs> exactly, but uh, 
but what I would like is to maybe ask them to send me the the groove track, the MIDI groove track of that, because that could be the basis <laughs> of a really cool kind of broken beat, broken beat <laughs> track. It's like it sounds like it was played, you know, it manually. wasn't even six ones. Yeah, it was like it's totally manually and uh, perhaps without even a, a click track or something. Yeah. Sounds maybe it was random. maybe it was cut up tape tape cut up kind of style. That was the other possibility it could have been. Actually, you, you know that I've I've heard of someone who studied, I don't remember in which university in in Belgium or something like that, and his assignment was to create a multi track <clears throat> by cutting tape, not like that, but like that. So basically, cross fading. So if you put two pieces of tape. Each one has a different thing recorded, and you and you then slice it like that. You will have cross fades. You know what I mean, oh, and things like that. So, yeah. So maybe I have to be quite a long. It'd be pretty hard to because I mean, you know, we say that, but actually, yeah, yeah. you're probably talking you, seventeen inches per you second. Would, you're talking exactly. about fifteen you feet. Would probably, a... <laughs> no, you would probably want to do it in seven and a half uh ips not yeah, not, not would, more I than that imagine so yeah yeah it's interesting um i I'll, I'll come to other reactions first before because this this brings up some <laughs> other interesting questions as well i Ch charles uh, you're probably just a little bit too old to remember that from your youth i'd imagine uh, uh, too young to too young remember. sorry i do beg your pardon <laughs> um the uh, uh that was uh my grandfather's generation but uh you know the uh kid god i didn't realize that um International Health Pancakes served LSD as well. That's just, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you know, you were talking about the nuclear family. And I was like, it's more like the nuclear mutant family. There's just the strangest sound. I should thing add, I've heard. allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. To that statement. Yeah. yeah, it was, that's the crazy, I heard that the other day. That thing is, that is the craziest thing. And I don't remember the, I remember their ads from a few years later. And by the way, now they're called, I think International House of Burgers. They changed their name just recently, like in the past couple of months. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Um, and, I and Hob. Burger King. Hmm. Yeah, IHOP, exactly. And Burger King has been trolling them on Twitter about it ever since. Call, they're going to call themselves Pancake King or something like that now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, I, I, I can't, yeah, there weren't that many modules around. And it, it probably was. Yeah, it probably was a book. I mean, yeah, I, the irony being he wasn't really into going for the mainstream. Well, that's very much not a mainstream thing, even though it ended up as an IHOP commercial. But, you know, that's the sort of thing like if it had if it had been if it had gained some traction, I would have heard that at some point. But I've never heard that. So that commercial probably died a very quiet death. Um, <laughs> it's the strangest thing. Very creepy. Yeah. Yeah, but I know what you're saying. But it appeals to everything I love about music. Like I love that that time period and that sort of like half remembered dream kind of state, you know, hypnagogic state, and I love that kind of stuff. But that's just too weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Try, imagine trying to put a beat to that. That would be so. Yeah, it would be pretty challenging, well, I'd imagine. Well, I suppose yeah. Balls of Canada have kind of made a whole career out of doing that. Mm -hmm. which is a funny thing. When I was looking at this advert earlier, there was a couple of things that made me laugh. And, and just before you cut it off, Nick, there's the narrator said something which just really got me thinking. He says, prices designed for a very hungry family. I was just thinking, so what price is that? What would that be? Would that be really cheap, really expensive? I, I don't know. So uh, we'll have to find out. That's quite subtle. Affordable, you, you, okay. You, you, You'd never get that subtle. Uh, but Steve, this is this yeah. brings up an interesting thing, and it ties in a little bit with what you were saying earlier, this sort of mad deadline. I mean, the thing is, you know, that because of the, you know, judging it by the standards of now, we, you know, some of us might, might think it's horrible, some think it's might, kind of cute or interesting or whatever, but it comes to that thing when you, you know, you as a musician or as a producer or whoever, you have to take work. You take work. Sometimes you don't get to choose all the good stuff that you can work on, so you have to take jobs where you just think, oh, do I really have to? And you just have to get on with it and do it. And it's just kind of uh, that that scenario where you find you're so, you're you're not very proud of doing it at the time, but you know sometimes when you look back, it's actually oh actually that wasn't so bad. And I I just wondered whether there there yeah. were any that that triggered any memories or uh, thoughts. Oh man, well uh, yeah, I, I did I did think about this, and yeah, I've got a long history of doing <laughs> things for money that I'm not proud of. <laughs> In fact, musically, I should add, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. All oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. All oh, right. Um, the very, um, the very first 
piece of music that I did to a commission was back in 1990, and it was for a, a radio station up in the northeast called Metro, Metro FM. I think it's still there. And um, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was happy to take the money. Uh, and the campaign was, uh, it was called Drug Busters, and it was an anti-drugs campaign, which is, you know, okay, fair play. Um, but then I decided, you know what would be really funny? I'll do an acid house tune. And so throughout this anti trucks mm -hmm. campaign, you had these blah, 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 squiggles of music that was supremely connected to taking drugs. And, and you know, funny enough, they didn't ask me back. But, well, um, <laughs> but I'm, no, I'm surprised because quite often with that sort of thing, you're trying to appeal to youth culture, you know, to, so you'd want to use terms of reference that were relevant. So I'm surprised at that to a degree. Yeah. Uh, I, I think if, if the if the radio station had been run by musicians, they probably would have got it. But instead, it was more like you know, like broadcasters who are they have one eye on uh, the what the tabloid press are telling them about things, and another eye pointing elsewhere. I don't know. That's a strange image. Um, <laughs> there was something else <laughs> that I thought I'd mention. There's um, there was a remix uh, that I did. Uh, in the Dubstar days, in the later Dubstar days, about 2012, for a band from Australia called uh, Parallax. And they had uh, supplied us with uh, like a, an electro pop tune. And we were just sort of really just had no idea what to do. And there was this recording session where we had run out of time. And all we could think of doing um, before the pubs open, I should say, was to take this electropop tune and then convert it into a sort of, I don't know, Phil Spector type thing. Then the pubs opened. Of course, we spent a few hours down there. We came back and this sounded crazy. So then it was a question of getting out all these old shoegaze and, and indie records from the 80s and sampling the Jesus and Mary Chain and slowing it down. And we'd run out of time. I just thought, okay, sorry, mate, here's the remix. But it went out, and I was a—I've been ashamed of it and of taking the money ever since. Until I listened to it a couple of days ago, and actually, it's—I think it's my favourite remix I've ever done because it's <laughs> mental. It's just absolutely—it makes absolutely no sense when you compare it to the original. But in terms of creativity, it was a combination of uh, anxiety, alcohol, and a deadline that produced this mad thing. So if you, if you look on. Um, uh, the internet that we have these days and look for Parallax Dubstar remix of Machines, you'll hear the tune that I'm talking about. Parallax Dub, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find that out. So, uh, yeah. I don't know, Yoad, I, I, I suspect, you know, I mean, we've all kind of been there. I wonder if if, uh, if if you've been in that situation or whether you are fortunate enough to be able to pick and choose uh, more. Well, I, you know, I, I try to be uh, picky these days, but I, I didn't you know get to where i am overnight it took it took a long time and uh in my time i did some uh pretty nasty uh things as well and uh <laughs> you know it's just if, if basically it's it's a lot easier to engineer and to mix something which you don't really connect to uh, than to produce it obviously uh, because uh, when yeah, you mix, I, 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 it's almost like I wear a different hat and I and I take the, the tracks and I mix them and I try to 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 dig the music and to get into the mind of or the mindset of that particular style and and just do it and I can and I and it's you know it's still creative and it's still I give it the the, the same kind of attention and everything uh, it may just not be my cup of tea or. Yeah, but obviously these days, if something is not right or it sounds shit, then I I wouldn't do it. But sometimes you get you get mixes which um, something is not quite right. But then I get in communication with the producer or the artist or whatever, and and try to see if it's possible to re-record something or the vocals or or things like that. So. Um, it, basically, you know, um, if I if I can see that I can improve on something, then I would try to do everything I can to to accommodate yeah. for that. No, I totally get that. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I, the, I, I did a lot of remixes back sort of, you know, last century in the sort of 90s. And I do remember the ones that I didn't enjoy were the ones that 
we were rushed on, you know, that it was just like, right, let's just do it. You know, we've, we've got to finish it by tomorrow. And I'd be thinking, oh God, you know, that I didn't trust my instincts at all. So I would be for like, well, I won't have time to make the bad parts, which of, of which there are probably loads good enough. And I just remember we did a remix of, um, oh God, uh, uh, the Corgis, everybody's got to learn sometime. We did three versions. We did a kind of like slow nineties kind of, you know, hip hop groove type thing, a house one. And then this kind of disco version, which we did in like two hours. And it was after we'd finished, so we had most of the arrangement. And, and and I thought, oh, this is terrible. And I went back to listen to it, you know, sometime later. And I thought, actually, that, you know, it, it's got a sort of energy and urgency. And I, I, it's what it is. I mean, in, in some ways, you think, well, why on earth did I spend so much time on all the other stuff when this thing sounded okay? No, no Nick, this, is, this has been uh, my experience through the years as well. And it's something that um, when I'm pretending to be a lecturer, I tell my students all the time, it, try and work as quickly as you possibly can. Um, because then you're you're working on your initial inspiration, you're working on the energy of the music, you're not thinking so much, and so often you end up with uh, you know better music as a consequence, as you've just demonstrated. And I would recommend this to everybody: if you can turn around, you know, like finish compositions within regularly within I don't know two hours, I, th I think that's really will improve the quality of your work. Yeah. I would say. Well, I think uh, if we had Ty on, then he'd be a, a massive advocate for that because that's what he does or sort of 23 hours a day by the sounds of it, which is why he's never on yeah. the show because he's so busy. <laughs> I know, Charles, I mean, I'm sure you've been in the same situation. I mean, it's different when you've got a paying client. And well, sometimes when you've got a client in and they just go, oh, can we just, you know, I've only got an hour. You sometimes yeah. get that scenario, don't you? Yeah. Um, but, I, but, you know, I mean, what he said, I, I, I think the whole idea of turning stuff around really fast is such a good thing. It's all my best work has always been the fast stuff that I did. Um, in fact, uh, I saw that you had posted something about um, the new uh, BOO, Battery, Battery Operated Orchestra record coming out, and I did a remix on that. And I knocked it out so fast, you know, and, I, and that's one of my favorite remixes. So I, I love doing stuff fast, but I also have done some work that I belabored for a long time and I'm not happy with it, but hey, I got paid to do it. But oh god, I just wish it wasn't out there on the internet. And I won't point to anybody to it. I won't show anybody <laughs> where it is. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's yeah. an it's an interesting kind of uh, conflagration, and it's something that generally, I mean, you either have to be so arrogant that you know, and inexperienced that you just go, oh, I don't care, they'll be happy with it, or it, you just have to be experienced enough to know that it'll be okay you know even if it's not my best. i've said this many many times i think uh anyway uh what's next oh have you seen this uh, yamaha want to know uh what uh, your synth ideas are they've started a new forum uh which is actually a third party uh, application which is called i know what's it called it's called uh oh i've forgotten idea what it's scale called. Or something. idea scale that's right and uh, they're saying, join our new community. Uh, let us know your ideas. Got an idea for a synthesizer or feature. We have just the group for you. Set up an idea scale. It's a limited edition. And I actually, I, I joined uh, just so I could keep an eye on things. And, and essentially, it seems to be the idea of, you know, you you just, somebody posts an idea for it. It gets upvoted or downvoted. And then presumably, the folks at Yamaha might well, um, you know, pull it on board. And uh, I got into a lot of trouble with this in the comments, particularly one guy who just sort of, because I sort of said, well, is it, you know, perhaps in response to the kind of analog revolution? As we know, large Japanese corporations are generally quite slow to move. I mean, yet Roland have changed their structure so they can move more quickly, and they have. Yamaha are still quite old school in that respect. You know, they're very big, and, 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 and they do what they do is great for what they need, and they obviously don't feel pressure to do it, but it feels like maybe is this in response to some of that? And I was uh, heavily chastised saying that they'd always done this sort of thing and always and had innovated lots of technology or whatever. And, and I'm sure that's true. But it's an interesting idea. But I wonder whether people now are, are perhaps a little too cynical to uh, to kind of go, yeah, you can have my idea because there's no there's no mention of reward <laughs> in any of this. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I was sort of thinking, you know, if I wanted a new synthesizer from Yamaha, what would I want? Uh, and also, what great idea would I have that I'd be happy to give away? And I just realized, you know, what I'd really like from Yamaha is a proper update to FM synthesis, you know? Um, and the reason I say this is that a, 
about a year ago, I got um, the Reface DX, you know, when they released the, the whole load of sort of recreations of old synths and one new one. And initially, I really liked it. But then I kind of noticed that the the sound quality just, I don't know, there was something I wasn't sure about. So I compared the Reface DX to my DX100, which you can see just mm -hmm. behind me there. Um, and I just noticed, no, this, this sounds really different and not in a good way. So... Consequently, thinking about this, what I would propose to Yamaha is I would like them to do a proper update of an FM synth. What I want is I want to see algorithms you can design to be anything you want, a bit like on the Native Instruments FM8. What I'd like to see is analog filters built into each voice, but also an analog filter that you don't just stick at the end of the, the, the signal chain. It can be at any point within you know, any aspect of the algorithm. I want the oscillators to sound as solid as they do on uh, Serum, X for Records Serum, and the ability to draw in or, or design waves. So you can have essentially any wave that you want that would be uh, manipulated within uh, FM. Um, and that sounded really good. And in my head, it would cost two hundred pounds. So I've bought one in my imagination already. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's interesting. I mean, they—it's not like uh, Yamaha haven't re you know represented FM. Montage has got really yeah. monstrous FM capabilities, like sixteen yeah. operators or something. I mean, it's insane. And I know that sort of uh, Richard Devine did a lot of patch design for that. And it, I've been trying to find someone who understands it enough to kind of come and do a presentation ever since it came out. But it's been very difficult to find. And I'd love to, because I mean, I'm sure there's a lot there. And they they did bring out um, other other sort of FM type. Uh, uh, well, obviously the Reface, and then before that, I forget there were the little desktop boxes. They did a load of different flavors. I can't remember what they were called, and they did an FM version of that as well. So they keep doing it, but maybe it's not to your yeah what you want. Well, it, th there's certain things that I feel that they haven't got right. I mean, the montage thing is really good and very complicated, even for me who's been a FM head since school. But um, I just noticed that with the reface thing, they put in some facilities that weren't available in the original incarnations of FM Synths. But the but overall, the sound wasn't as good as the, uh, as I said, the DX100 or even the DX11, which I've got in a cupboard just back there. There's, there. There was something that was missing. And I sort of felt, you know, am I kidding myself? Am I doing that thing of, you know, only liking vintage digital synths, and what you, which would be a bit bizarre. But no, I've done a, I've done an AB between uh, the two and use them both in, in recordings. And this unquestionably, I feel like they went off at a tangent that wasn't, wasn't at least mm. right for me on oh, FM. So okay. come back, Yamaha. Well, there you go. They can have that one for nothing. It's 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 always this is a question that's always hard to ask someone who actually does design instruments for a living, or at least part of what they do. Because I'm sure you've got lots of very strong ideas about this. But I mean, in terms of what Yamaha are doing, yeah, and it's kind of it it feels like a, 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 a sea change to me. But maybe maybe I'm just uh, over reading. I think, no, I think it's a, it's a really good um, it's a really good direction. Um, when you design products, I think uh, because you have a community of uh, of of beta testers and uh, of other other channels of you know of opinions that you can um, that you can get from people, and I think it's 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 a it's a fine line between having something which is designed by committee, uh, then and on the other hand you have an idea and you just go with it and you know you do your your thing kind of all the way because if you start listening to, to all the different voices around you too much whilst in the kind of basic designing um process then it, it could be quite frustrating at times because you can't you, you will never please everybody um and so as as a developer i you know, for a big company like like Yamaha, I think it makes a lot of sense because they can have the, they have the they have the ability to deal with all these opinions and and like you said, it's a, it's a quite slow, you know, moving beast. It's it's huge, and I can't even imagine how to how you can get an idea and and make it happen uh, through all, through all the stages that it has to uh, to go through. It's hard enough 
in to do it in waves which is a which is a tiny company in comparison to Yamaha so all these processes are but I think it's I think it's it's a good it's a good way of of basically you know when you sell stuff on eBay or something or as a, or Airbnb or whatever then you have reviews and you have basically feedback from the community from people and I think why not add that as an element of the designing uh, process yeah I, I, I think that's probably true but I mean in a way you know it's the way that uh, certainly Korg went a slightly different way with just having uh, having sort of superstar designers aspect to it so you know mm -hmm. Tatsuya is he, he was the visionary behind a whole series of products which really did very well for Korg uh, I, I'm not sure if that's the same in Roland because I don't we're not so aware of their internal structure but I suspect it's something along those lines as well but any corporation that has to invest in new technology as Yamaha have done they will want to see a return over iteration so they're looking I guess in terms of looking for the next big thing they might also be looking for something that they can re reuse you know in the same way that they have with the motif and that, that sort of thing and that's fine mm -hmm. you know it's a way of doing business I don't know Charles what would you like to see from uh, Yamaha assuming you, you you've had anything you'd care to share with us or them oh yeah yeah um uh, two things I've had from Yamaha that I really have liked a lot is I had a CS20 which which I still have but it doesn't function very well and uh, a dx7 and it would be nice to have i mean that's what they did they they, they were pioneers in the in the whole uh, fm synthesis uh and then the structure of the of the cs series not the not the, like, the cs1 or any of that stuff but you know the the old analog cs stuff i'd love to see them do like a updated version of that that sort of stuff you know it, it is something that they i mean it's not really breaking any new territory but it's it's sort of uh, polishing up something that they had started many years ago, and I, I think they have an opportunity here. It's it's kind of tricky. I think one of the reasons they probably took on this um, idea scale thing is because it's not that there aren't any new ideas under the sun. Well, maybe there aren't, but um, but it's it's hard to figure out what new ground to break at this time, and yeah. so they're probably trying to figure out how to break this new <clears> ground. <throat> But I think you know one section of it is they should take what they've done in the past and and just make better versions of it. You know, I would love I'd love to have another CS twenty that actually works. You know, yeah. <laughs> mine doesn't because it's so old. You know, and I yeah. haven't bothered to get it repaired. And yeah. if you repair it, it still has to constantly be repaired anyway. But yeah, I'd love yeah, to see I them. So. I, I have the CS, the Reface uh, CS version, which you know it's it's nice, but similar to the DX, you know, it doesn't. It doesn't sound fantastic. It's but it's mm. fine. You know, it no. does like nice pads and things like that, but it's not fantastic. Right. Um, I'd, I'd like to make uh, just a, another suggestion to Yamaha if they're listening and building on what uh, Charles has just said there about going back to the stuff they did really well and maybe taking it somewhere new. We've had uh, what at least a decade, I think, of uh, really good manufacturers making base synths. So I'm thinking of Moog have done this and Korg have done this. Okay, Yamaha, how about this as an idea? You make a monophonic FM synth. It's a bass synth. It's got just two operators, and it's got knobs on the front, and there's one for ratio, there's one for level, for operator two, and then there's just a uh, knobs for an ADSR uh, for the first operator and for the second one. Uh, and then you'd have nothing else in it. It's just that, just two operators, one voice. It's an FM based synth, and you sell it for fifty quid. Hmm. There's a thought. Uh, yeah, I, I just... think that would be. I think that would be extraordinary, quite frankly, because you know, um, the digital bass, FM bass, is a is a fantastic sound. I, I use absolutely. it all the time. I'm in love with it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, why not open up like a whole world of you know uh, digital bass to a new generation with really simple controls that people can buy for the same price as a Volker, and also not pretend that it's an electronic, you know, electric piano or a bell or anything like that. Oh yeah, and also make it velocity sensitive, please. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I, I, oh, sorry, go, Yard. Yeah, basically, uh, Steve, you're just describing Logic's, uh, Logic's internal FM synth. It's just word yeah. to word. Uh, and it's a, it's a really, really good synth. You can make like really heavy kind of UK bass sort of sounds and, and all that. It's just the one for that. I love that synth, by the way. For absolutely. You know, it looks kind of silly because it doesn't have a lot of knobs on it, but the sound is absolutely immense. 
It's funny, we keep yeah. coming back to these old uh, Logic instruments. I, I, one thing I would say in Yamaha's defense, or not that they're being bashed necessarily, is that um, they the stuff that they make generally is very robust. I mean, the refaces are, are very nicely built. You know, they don't build cheap mass production stuff below a certain th quality threshold. So there's always going to be a price premium for the way that they work. And that is obviously, you know, that's obviously across the company and that's, that may be, you know, a philosophy that they follow. And that's totally yeah. fair enough. And But I think that will automatically create a price point which is perhaps higher than things some of the competition are prepared to do in terms of cutting corners from manufacturing pr uh, process. Yeah, Nick, I, I think that's completely fair. And also to add to that, to be fair to Yamaha, behind me, I've got, uh, a DX100, a DX7, in uh, that cupboard there, there's a DX11, and I've had them for decades, and they've never let me down. No problem with them at all. Uh, so I think, you know, well done to Yamaha for that. Yeah, no, that's fa that's fair enough. Good point. Right, I think we'll just take a short break for a message from our friends at Isotope. Of course, this is uh, Isotope Vocal Synth 2. Uh, this is the teaser video, but essentially with the, they've completely redesigned the interface. We've got a brand new vocoder, new BioVox module, which does uh, vocal track modeling, which is very good. Uh, new, like I say, uh, improved vocoder, more bands, higher quality, CompuVox module, uh, TalkBox module, and all lots of pitch correction and uh, loads of effects. And the effects are all reorderable as well. Lots of really powerful vocal processing thing for a very modern sound. If you want to try that out, head over to isotope.com forward slash vocal synth. Uh, vocals evolved. Exactly what I was just saying. So, and we did have a competition from last week and we got a winner uh, there. And the winner from last week uh, is uh, somebody called... Uh, Taya or Thea, I'm not sure, Cochrane, who is actually an audio preservation engineer, which is kind of interesting. I imagine they've probably got a few other Isotope products, but uh, I said, uh, I need to plan better next year and try to get to the Leeds modular meet, which is a random thing, but that's a fair comment to make because, of course, uh, DivKids, uh, aka Ben Wilson, Leeds modular meet was at the weekend, which by all uh, intents was another great venue. But uh, you've won. <laughs> you've won vocal synth. But thanks for the message. So if you want to get in touch <laughs> at Thea Cochran, Cochran then uh, we will be able to uh, pass that on to you. And we're going to have a winner for next week. And we're looking for the hashtag five vocal tools. That's the number five, five vocal tools and the hashtag vocal synth two. And tweet that to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. Yes, you do need to be on Twitter, but uh, it's no biggie. Uh, so the hashtag five vocal tools and the hashtag vocal synth to at sonic state not at isotope inc and we'll pick a winner for next week so thank you very much um okay right uh, now this is again a kind of slightly random um topic but i'm not sure why this came up but youtube's i think youtube's suggestion algorithms are getting much more kind of uh, uh, advanced and I, and I think actually a friend of mine posted uh, this snippet that was on a facebook video and i just thought well, yeah bernard purdy so uh, this is Bernard Purdy demonstrating the Purdy Shuffle, uh, a drum clinic. The Purdy Shuffle started many, 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 many moons ago. But the best part of the Purdy Shuffle is you've got to remember one thing. The slower you do it, the more effective it is. Try never to do it like this. Oh. <laughs> Purdy Shuffle consists of two bars. It's a two bar phrase. And if you think about it as a two bar phrase, you'll come out with everything that you need. Eight. Hey, no. I, I don't know about you. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I think I gravitate towards shuffle sounds, and uh, Bernard Purdy is kind of one of the, you know, the. The, the 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 sound of Steely Dan Asia and stuff, which is very much of its time. But he was, he's not the only person. But there's, it's just, what a great groove. And he worked with Steely Dan, Quincy Jones, James Brown, Miles Davis, Aretha Franklin. I mean, masses and masses. Still going. Seventy nine. I'm not sure when this was recorded. Doesn't look like it's that long ago. Although that is actually in yes. like four, three, three. Or four years ago. Yeah. So three or four. So you know, still doing drum cut. And the whole thing, he's just sort of like speaking rhythmically while he's just playing grooves it's mm -hmm. a lovely thing to watch and he's just the ease with which he does it i don't know um if any has anyone ever worked on a bernard mm. purdy multi-track uh, where he's been on that would be uh that would be uh, imagine that oh i have actually have you <laughs> i have actually yeah uh it was um i mean i i didn't do it for commercial release i did it because i you know i studied with al schmidt and um 
we had all the multi tracks from Asia. So that had Helmet Last wow. on it, which he played that groove on. Um, yeah, it sounded great. It sounded great. It was on, I think, if I remember correctly, it was only on four audio tracks like kick, snare, and then just a, a sum of the, all the other drums on, in stereo. Nice. Um, yeah, but it, yeah, he's fantastic. <laughs> he's fantastic. I mean, that was, he was playing Helmet Last basically right there, it's just talking over it, you know, with no music. So, uh, yeah, he's fantastic. God, he's so good. It's, so it's interesting good. that I mean, does, and, and I guess the other question is, do you have any sort of favorite grooves? Because I mean, you know, we all went through phases where their groove, uh, the groove was very popular. I mean, you know, back in the the nineties, it was the funky drummer, and then it was the soul to soul beat, and then uh, you know, there are all these kind of classic grooves which tend to kind of perpetuate. So there are, uh, and the Amen break, there are libraries of specific grooves with specific drummers. I just wondered if you had any specific favorites. Yeah, uh, so I worked with this drummer. Uh, it, uh, it was, I forgot the name of the band. They did the, the, the theme song to friends. Um, oh yeah. Uh, oh gosh. the something, wasn't it? The, the auteurs yeah. or the, the, not the, re- the, not the replacements. It was, yeah, it was, it was something, something like, like that, that. Wasn't it? Okay. Yeah, okay. I, so I worked with the drummer from that group and, um, I had a recording I'd made of him for some other project. And, uh, you know, I asked him if it was cool if I did this, but I, I, I sampled the hell out of that track because there were so many great grooves all in just this one song. And I think I probably produced maybe 30 or 40 songs that had that, you know, his drumming on it in various places. And it, and that's <laughs> so the thing is, like, yeah, I do like I, I do like grooves like I love hearing Bernard Pretty play and so forth, but. I, I I've always gravitated towards something that I didn't think anybody else would have heard. Um, the the Rembrandt, the Rembrandt. Rembrandt, that's it. There yeah. we go. That's yeah. uh, we got like Sky the, the Sky Scratch in the chat room. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Um, and so uh, yeah, he he was great. He had a 1947, I think it was Gretsch medallion kit. It sounded beautiful. Um, I just put a couple of mics on the kick, a couple on the snare, and then a couple of room mics and that was it and it just sounded beautiful and i just yeah i just made a stereo mix of it and i used it on so many things and that was my favorite groove of all time but uh, uh and i just love his playing it works with almost any kind of style of music and it's worth i but i always i, I gravitate towards things that i didn't think anyone else would have heard right uh, okay because i didn't fair. want anyone to identify it so, so steve uh, you and i both know <laughs> that we've used we know. those those <laughs> trope grooves and uh, remix you know remixes throughout the time i mean did you did you find yourself trying to uh modify them so they weren't quite so yes. naked yeah yes absolutely um there was a sort of uh, for people who don't know my, my background is a uh, is as DJing, and I uh, initially was sort of uh, DJing sort of electronic music in the eighties, but then um, hip hop sort of took off, and then the rare what was called rare groove took off, which was essentially jazz funk, but it was being yeah. rediscovered in the eighties, and what that meant was that they were in, in the middle of so many of these records they had a drummer's break. And that was essentially a solo by the drummer. And it meant what was happening here was that hip hop guys were getting two records and they were, which were identical and they were playing the drummer's break on the left hand de- uh, disc. And then when it came to an end, they would then mix in the same break from another record. So they were creating you know, a, basically an infinite length uh, drummer solo. And I loved all that stuff, but there was a sort of year zero for me. And there was a record that came out, which was by, I think they only ever had one tune. They were from Bristol. They were called Fresh Four. Uh, They did a version of a song called Wishing on a Star. And it blew my mind for lots of different reasons. The the first one was that it was so sparse. It was like a a dub record, but with hip hop breaks going on. And then I realized, listening to it, that it was a combination of two different break beats. Now, there was the very famous uh, James Brown funky drummer, which all of us here would instantly recognize. But they combined, they slowed it down a bit, and then they combined it with what sounds to me like uh, a song called I'm Coming by Bobby Bird. Which okay, also, I, I, I have it here. I'm going to play it a yeah. little bit of it, but I don't want to. I'll, I'll just bring it up underneath while you carry on talking. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's like I'm back on the radio. So... Um, so you had these two breakbeats going on at the same time and now we've, we've gone to a completely 
sort of new place. Um, it, it was no longer just kind of like regular uh, hip hop, and yeah. it wasn't just taking a bit of somebody's record and looping it. There was a new creativity that had gone on, and I found that uh, really inspiring. And in fact, um, Again, just refer- referencing my old band, if you listen to um, what was uh, ultimately the biggest dub star tune, Stars, the very first thing that you hear is uh, a very famous sample, which I'm not going to name, um, is... but it's but it's, but yeah. it's played twice. Right. It's played twice at two different sections within the breakbeat at two different speeds. And so you get that kind of like tumbling snare pattern that became very very popular uh, uh with the jungle djs when they chopped up the amen break so yeah to answer your question yes <laughs> i've just yes. i'm just looking at the video i've got the video here actually and i'm just looking and that looks like i remember this this was smith and mighty remix this yeah that sounds and, about right and i just saw i think that was daddy g who was one of the uh, members of Massive Attack, so I think this might have been his first thing. There he is. I'm pretty sure that's Daddy G. Anyway, that's that's that. It's, a, it's, a, it's an absolutely oh. extraordinary record, I think. And and it's a sort of, it's the very tail end of the 80s that I think people kind of uh, often overlook. That bit before, sorry to use a dirty phrase here, but Trip Hop took over in the 90s. Yeah, it's it's song, where, yeah. Well, well, yeah, where you had this, the amazing sound of these live drummers but being placed in samplers and making not rap but a different kind of uh, pop music which uh, is um, extraordinary and and i i do actually kind of regret very deeply that we don't have so much of this going on today i think that the lawyers in the, the music industry rather clamped down on that towards the mid to end of the 90s so whereas you had these incredible records um being made by people like norma cook who lives just over there um made up of cutouts of other people's records that doesn't happen now it's just too expensive and i, mm. I think that's a shame yeah i suppose so i, I don't know uh, yeah i mean you get a lot of multi-tracks through uh, i mean do you often get an actual drummer on the multi-tracks these days or has it mostly been you know uh, no i do mix uh, i do mix some drums with uh some tracks with drums i always enjoy it i mean that's the best like when you when you start the mix and you're pushing the faders up and you hear like a real real kit, uh, kit then that's always uh that's always nice um even though it may end up not quite the same after i finish with it but uh but you know that's that's what we do uh, but obviously the when the the essence is there and the sound is there and what i would like to say about uh, bernard's am- amazing um, video is just if you notice you can't see any mics in the picture the only mic you can see is his headset Maybe there's an overhead mic somewhere, but the sound on this video is amazing. And then I went back and and watched some some of it other videos, which I which I've seen some of them um, in the past. It it's the the sound of his kit. It just sounds amazing. You know, the balance is perfect, and it's a very light every, player, isn't he? As well, yeah. Yeah, but it's like the, there's something about the instrument that it it you know it, it kind of um it just sounds great it's an extension um, of him. exactly yeah. exactly and the way he sings and the way he plays and the way it all sounds and the way he hits the hi hat it's it's just magical it's just uh, yeah. an amazing there, uh, there are i mean there are a number i mean obviously there are a number of other fabulous drums i've got a couple of favorite uh, uh, but uh because i was originally going to ask this question any other favorite drummers and i didn't ask that question so i'll answer with a couple of my favorites and uh obviously steve jansen m- more of a modern drummer kind of combination of machines and overdubs he was kind of the master of playing on top of drum machines and and uh, astonishing grooves and i remember seeing him once live play in bath and he looked so bored it just looked like it was so easy for him and it was <laughs> it was really complicated and i sort of i felt I felt it was almost, I was a bit disappointed that he wasn't trying very hard, you know, but uh, anyway, that's one thing. But uh, got to gotta say a uh, real big Richie Hayward of Little Feet. Again, very brilliant uh, sort of purdy shuffle drummer. Absolutely amazing. L- uh, Little Feet's last record album. I and mean, while it's very sort of bluesy and swampy, it, it, you know, might not be everybody's cup of tea. The drumming and the rhythm is fantastic. Also, uh, John Stephen French of Captain Beefheart, another amazing drummer that, uh, you know, you just don't get those kind of mad ones anymore so much, I suppose. But uh, I did have a couple of bits mm. queued up, but I didn't, uh, I never 
kind of got them ready, so I'm not going to play them now. But if check it out, um, J- uh, Richie Haywood, amazing drummer. Yeah. Well, I can tell There's you who mine Steve is. Gadden. Oh, who's oh, your Art. favorite? Yeah. Go on then. You go first. Anyway. Um, Neil Peart from Rush is like he's a genius. The man is a genius. Um, I like Phil Collins. I like his drumming uh, in Genesis and and uh, even in his stuff in in the eighties. I think he has an amazing sound and he started this whole obviously gated reverb stuff uh, and all that. But but if, you know, he has a uh, he has an amazing sound. Uh, Omar Hakim, um, the way he plays on on David Bowie's Let's Dance is just mind blowing. Uh, on the ho- the whole album, his sound and his Steve Gadd obviously. Uh, there's some really, really great dramas, but Neil Peart is is the man for me. Uh, o- obviously, Nick Mason and Ringo Starr, you have to mention them yeah, as yeah. well. But uh... there's a lot. I mean, there's loads and loads of US drummers. There was a big period where drummers from the US were really popular, and, and I think um, oh, this is just a, a, a simple fact that a, a lot of them were uh, they learnt their chops either in military bands or in marching bands where you the snare work was kind of you know it was all very disciplined and so a lot of those guys their their snare work was just so and their feel was so great because they were so disciplined I don't know that that happened so much now I mean there are still I mean the, the, the age of superstar drummers seems to have dropped off a bit it's more seems to it's more about the personality and the kind of what they project than than maybe what they're playing so much now. But anyway, everybody gets a go. So uh, so uh, Steve, favorite drummers or dr- or group uh, uh, or, or grooves? No, um, I'm my favorite drummer really comes from my childhood. Um, Stuart Copeland, remember him? Ah, oh, yes. yeah, uh, brilliant. So he drummers. was the yeah, yeah. So he was the drummer in the Police. And I think if you listen back, not to um, not to the last Police album, or that is really good as well. But just basically the earlier stuff, you really can hear. A, a, a musicality there, a sort of personality that I haven't really spotted elsewhere. I mean, to be honest, I haven't been looking, but he springs to mind. Uh, and also he was a good songwriter as well, which wasn't given a lot of credit, literally, in the police. That's very true. Quite a lot of similarities between Stuart Copeland's style and uh, Omar Hakim, I would say. But that's just an observation. But anyway, uh, Charles. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say Stuart Copeland. He he beat me to the punch on that one because uh, <laughs> sorry, especially on on Ghost of the Machine. I love the playing on that. Um, that's to me that's 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 their best record. I mean, I don't. I don't uh, Synchronicity has good songs on it, but it's nothing compared to the brilliance of the whole album of Ghost of the Machine. And his playing is fantastic on that. I absolutely love that album. It's the it's um, the power of the three piece, isn't it? Once again, you know, it just, is. Really Again, is, yeah. you just have to kind of do whatever you can with what you've got left, or it has, the idea has to be so strong in the first place to be able to be uh, uh, rendered with only three musicians. You know, so yeah, that, yeah. That, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, I, I, time's marched on. I haven't really realised that we've got so far. So I, when you have to make a choice between the uh, these two topics, we've got the what's the fascinating uh, fascination with these machines or the reverb quiz. So I'll take a poll on there. Hands up for uh, drum machines. Okay, two and hands up for the reverb quiz. So that yeah, that's a tie. Oh, that's that's very tricky. Okay, uh, damn. No, I, that, that's no. That's no that's, do them both. Do them both. All right. Well, we'll do that. Okay. So let's uh, let's get this is a video. This so is my uh, students and Eric Hawk Hawkins. That's close to me knows that I love drum machines. In fact, I got my start with drum machines in the studio with a classic DMX, Oberheim DMX, and a Lin drum, drum machine, the Lin drum two technically, but the Lin drum, drum machine. I, I mean, it is a very talky video. It's not really a sounds video, but it's just him. He's got a massive collection of video uh, of uh, drum machines. In fact, uh, this came from Synthtopia. And that was it featured. There's the DDD5, Korg, 626, Roland, Yamaha RX5, Sequential Tom, Oberheim DX, Air Laces, HRC. I mean, there's a whole bunch of 80s drum machines. And uh, listening to them now, you know, they're not, Actually, there's not so many that uh, they are of their time. There were there were less of them that you know. Obviously, we've got the the, the 808s and all of that sort of things. But these are more the digital side. I just wondered if there's uh, any kind of uh, are we 
are we looking back at these through sort of somewhat rose-tinted spectacles? I mean, the, the ability to program drum machines more effectively now, with pro particularly with parameter locking and parameter recording, has completely changed the way that drum machines are part of you know a, a pattern. Because you know now you might not necessarily program an entire song; you program a groove, but you can make it evolve by tweaking it and changing <coughs> parameters now. So that you know, is there anything that still stands the test of time? I'm going to come to you first, Johan, just because. Um... Yeah, I, I want to talk about the sound of these um, old drum machines. And uh, there's something about the mixer. When, when you have a digital mixer, so when you have a stereo out or a mono out, then it means that all the drums um, go to it in, through a digital mixer. The digital mixers, um, when they run on, uh, at 12-bit or, or 8-bit, they're going to introduce so much um, distortion and noise, even just for the fact that you have a fader, but then you have another summing stage. And so the degradation of the sound is so intense that you get this very distinct sound. Um, and if you listen to uh, the difference between, uh, let's say, RX-11 or, um, or, or something like that, uh, between the individual out, uh, the sound that comes out of the individual out, then to the sound of the of the mixer output, the the left right, the, there's such a big difference, and and this is something to that contributes a lot to to the sound. It's it sounds so bad um, that the sound doesn't have a choice but to become huge. So it's so it's it's like that and like that and then you turn up the volume you know it's like full of noise it's full of of kind of juicy digits kind of uh, all <laughs> squashed digits. together That's yeah. nice and uh, and uh, it just sounds it just sounds so good. Um, that's that's what I wanted to say about drum machines. So mm. it's it kind of people people are talking about the source, about the 808 kick and this and that and the the 909 hat and and all that. But um, by the way, on the 909, the mixer is is analog, I believe. I'm not sure uh, because it has analog elements and digital elements. It would make sense to 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 ah, okay. use the D2A and then to to mix it uh, in analog. So you wouldn't have the same. Not necessarily. You would have other artifacts uh, caused by cheap kind of, um, you know, uh, IC mixers and things like that. But um, but just to to I wanted to point point out that aspect right. of the sound of old drum machines that um, that's that's probably what is it's unique. Got. All I remember is uh, that I've just found them really infuriating to use because I hate doing with patterns. I don't know, Steve. You sounded like you were about to about to go there, and I'm guessing you know you you and I both grew up when drum machines. Well, actually, drum machines were more in the wane. Really, it was MPCs and and computer sequencing mm. and samplers that really kind of took over. When I was well, I, yeah. Um, I mean, I I do think that there's a lot of nostalgia. Uh, involved in looking back on these machines and, and liking them. I think that really they have been surpassed. Having said that, though, there's just a couple of things I want to mention. Um, if you can listen back to the raw sounds you get out of uh, Oberheim DMX or DX uh, or whatever it was, DMX, or, and then you compare that to uh, listen that to a Lindrum or a Drumulator, all of these sort of mid 80s or early 80s uh, digital drum machines. There's something about those sounds, and I'm not—I don't mean uh, the the mixing element and the digital degradation that Yoav was talking about. I'm talking about the the, the recordings themselves. They're really strong. They they they're completely dry, um, and they're highly usable sounds. Um, and I noticed, because uh, I was really just a kid when these things were coming out originally, I loved the sound of them. When I got my first digital drum machine, which was a, uh, an Alesis HR-16. If, if anyone oh, yeah, that. as for many. It was yeah. huge. That I, was had one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seemed that their big selling point was that they had a lot more memory in them, as in sample memory. And also it was higher quality samples as well. Um and so that was a good thing. But what I noticed was was that the 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 sounds were longer. They had more reverb on, but they were sort of 
they weren't com- they didn't have the same commanding presence that these older machines had with the shorter memory. And I realized that I think maybe the, the reason why these older machines to my ears sounded better was because the engineers had to get it right. There could, you couldn't have 20 different snare sounds. There was going to be one, maybe two at most, and that their length was going to be tiny. So those sounds had to be killer sounds. Um, I think that's part of the big appeal for me of these old drum machines. They just sound really good. The other thing is I would throw in, there was a period in uh, the mid eighties where bands were um, stopping you like guitar bands were stopping using drummers and using drum machines instead. And I went to two gigs and I saw two bands, um, which I didn't know prior to going to these gigs. I saw the Cocteau Twins yeah. um, support Orchestra oh, Maneuvers in the Dark them. on their Dazzle Ships tour. And they came on and they didn't have a drum. And I was thinking, this is mad. They had a tape machine. But then the sound that came out, it was the, the whole PA was, was being sort of dominated by this enormous guitar sound and drums that were just spot on all the way through. And it just felt great. But a year later, I stumbled into a Sisters of Mercy gig. And then and there was three guitarists on stage, no drummer, and a drum machine that nowhere to be found. Basically, you couldn't see anything because it was so dark and it was smoke everywhere. But again, it sounded tremendous. And it, it felt like this is the future. It's guys, well, being goths without drummers and dr- and having digital drum machines instead. It sounded really good. That's my nostalgia trip for these drum machines. Oh, goths without drummers. There's another classic show type. <laughs> There's, there's just there's just so many so many show titles here. I, I'm guessing Charles, you know, I mean, a lot of the bands that you are doing the sound for now, the front of house sound, because obviously you do OMD, you do Howard Jones. I mean, they are drum machine driven acts, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Uh, although they both of those acts choose to use a live drummer, though there is a lot of electronic drum stuff happening. Well, with Howard, it's all electronic drums. With OMD, it's uh, it's a live kick, live snare, live floor time, live hi hats, and everything else is electronic. Um, but yeah, you know, I was gonna say about the nostalgia thing. I think so. Like, I've had a lot of drum machines. I, I bought a Boss Doctor Rhythm when it first came out, the rig- the first one, uh, a 909, 808, 909, 707, 767, and so on and so on. And I just, uh, you know, I think, I think like right now we pine for sort of the analog sound and so forth and i think probably about 20 years from now people are going to pine for the mp3 sound or that you know i remember the old days of 12 and 16 bit you know i i just think there is a lot of nostalgia there 128 I mean, kbps yeah. yeah i did just buy a, a <laughs> drum brute you know um which which i love but i i bought it because of it's just it's there i can just hit go you know dial in tempo and hit go and i have like a, a basic thing i can play along with instead of setting up some sort of drum thing in Ableton or in Pro Tools or whatever. But generally speaking, I, I just, I'm just not really a huge fan of drum machines. Also, and, and on a further note, I'm probably get a lot of hate mail about this, but I just like, like I get so many emails every day from various sample companies saying the ultimate 808 collection, the ultimate yeah, 909. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. And I'm just like, how many more 808s and 909s do we need? How many more of these? How many more of these you know grooves and stuff i mean all this old stuff is it's it's all been sampled by somebody (laughs) just like yeah oh god i would agree if anything i gotta say that while i do a lot of remix work i I am kind of moving away from drums because i just feel like the market is saturated especially with all these old drum sounds it's just absolutely saturated it's like you know well why try to go into the same door that 500 other people are trying to cram into? I'm going to find a different doorway in. Uh, so, uh, but there, can, that, I, can I just say something in on, can I just quickly throw something in on the, what you just said there, Charles? Um, about so many 808 samples going around, and yeah, the market is saturated. But if you listen to, um, if you go onto Spotify and listen to Rap Caviar playlist, it's basically modern hip hop. And it seems like everybody is using um, 808 samples and everybody's using very similar, very slow grooves. And I was thinking, this is crazy. What? Why has this happened? Why is hip hop seems to just sort of stops and growing? And somebody um, who works for these uh, sort of people pointed out that actually where the artists are pointing their attention now is getting onto playlists. And if you're going to get onto a playlist, you've got to put out a sound that fits the current sound of the playlist. Consequently, 
That's why these guys are still using 808s. They are consciously trying to sound like the other tracks that are on that playlist in order to get on that playlist. So I would recommend, guys, just have a little listen to these really um, popular playlists and, and, and chat to people whose livelihoods depend on getting on them and see what, hear what they have to say. And it's usually that they're trying to make something that fits into that sound, hence... A thousand eight hundred eight libraries. That is interesting. That's so that reckon. that's really that's a really interesting point. So in some ways, the tyranny of you know we used to be trying to get on popular radio, Radio One or KR, KCR FM or whatever it is in the states, the equivalent. It used to be you know you had to fit a certain mold. You know whether it be the three minute single or the blah 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 blah. This is actually even more micro micro genre yeah, specific. specific. Ah, yeah. right. Okay. And, and also, so just, just just to add one further thing on this. This will only become more prevalent. For example, um, you know, around at my parents' house these days, they don't have a hi-fi. They have an Amazon uh, Alexa. So whenever they choose music, they're using their voice. They're not typing anything in. They're not looking through CDs or anything. Um, so they say, well, they, my parents don't say this, but a, a person would say, play me some modern hip-hop, and it goes straight to a playlist. It doesn't even, it even bypasses artists. It's straight to the style. And again, the style and what ends up on these playlists is, is determined by what fits in that playlist. Wow. So this voice activation thing is going to lead to even more. I, I, don't, I don't think this is a negative thing, actually. I don't think it's going lead to lead to homogeneity. But I think it does mean you're going to have to be, as a producer of music, very careful that you, what you do fits into these channels if you want to get paid. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That is that. That's a very good point. Did really did not know that. I wanted to call out a bit of love for the uh, the Kawai R50 actually of the digital oh, drum machines. Oh, love it. Because oh, yeah. and this is something because I I used to I, well I started working uh, I, I was working in the studio working on remixes and uh, before you know I, back in the DNA days you know I had my library of sounds and I stopped for a while and I was doing some other stuff and then I had to build up another one and I got all these sort of drum machine libraries when I started working with Goldfrap and the Kawai R50 all of the sounds out of that ha apart from maybe the bass pull or whatever it is they work they and they were the, whoever recorded them and it was because they, they were he heavily processed on record they sounded like they'd already come out of their separate outs and been turned into a modern drum sound for for its time mm -hmm. and there's some great if you check out the art the kawaii r50 and the r50 I, e I used to i used to have 100. one did you i used to have one i loved it it sounded so amazing and yeah. by the way the r100 which was its bigger brother with the multiple outs and and everything sounded sounded better but kind of sonically but there was something about the r50 that was just amazing there was one kick and one snare like the kind of gated one beefy snare drum two, two i think it was uh just an amazing and the hi-hat it's a really really good uh, little t um uh drum machine i couldn't afford the the r100 so i bought the the r50 at the time really good one yeah mm. I think that's uh, I, I think that's a good call. Uh, well, I, I think the R50 is good. So yeah, and there's there's plenty of sample sets out of there. I mean, I you know they've been going around for years. I mean, I used to collect them all into uh, into EXS and just either just and I, I have kit ones, but then I take all the kicks and I do all the kicks across the keyboard, mm -hmm. all the snares across the keyboard. So then you Same. could just uh, I mean, which is. But the, I'm coming back to, uh, you know, that's why when you mentioned your thing last time we spoke, you know, about the uh, the way that you dial Absolutely. in sound. Uh, we, and need, that, we need and, to do, do something on that at some point. That's Yeah, I know I was supposed to do it this week, but hopefully that's all right. this week. Yeah, but I mean, that's that's one of the uses that, that I, um, the ways I use uh, this thing with, with all the drum machine uh, kind of snares, and then you can scroll through. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay, well... Um, Okay, well, if, if we've got, have we got time to do this last one? Did, uh, oh, sure. Yeah, okay, right. This is the Reverb Quiz, and it has, can we guess what kind of synth or keyboard you play? And it's just one of those silly online things, and, you know, it's you, you do you do start, and you know, how long have you been playing, and you just kind of post uh, what sort of, uh, what's most important sound quality is there. And you go through all of them, and, and then it tells you what sort of synth it thinks you've got. Now, for me... It came up with a sub thirty-seven, which I do have, and I was like, "Wow, that's interesting." Uh, I spoke to Matt Hodson, uh, uh, and he said it said a growing Eurorack collection, which again is bang on for him. Uh, Charles, did you did you get a chance to check this out? I did. 
it said I would like a Rev 2. <laughs> Which, Which you exactly just bought. I just bought this week. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it, it was spot on, spot on. It's that it's, or sub or sub uh, sub thirty seven, in which I was also considering. That's <laughs> really interesting, isn't it? How they how they did. I mean, I don't know how. It's, it's obviously just you know, it's a matrix of uh, questions and lookups and all that. But you know, it's funny that it managed to get it right. Steve, did you take the did you take the challenge? Yeah, I did, and it came back. It was correct, actually. It came back with something like a, a, a collection of soft synths in a DAW. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's absolutely right. But then I remembered two questions earlier. It asked me something like, do you uh, use a computer for everything to do with music? And I was like, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I basically told him what I did. Yeah, well, that's... It back to me. Ah, uh, well, there you go. I, my answer to that question was, I think, um, sometimes for recording as well. Yeah. Right. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if you had a chance to try um, this one out. Sorry, I didn't. No, I didn't have time before the, the show. So oh, never time. mind. Never mind. But yeah, it was kind of a fun, it's just a fun little thing. But it, it's uh, it's interesting that uh, that that it manages. I mean, I don't know how many possible outcomes there were. So obviously, for as many as as many of it as it got right, I'd imagine you know. Well, actually, what's that? That's five out of five, uh, five, five, four out of four for us uh and but there are various other people who didn't get it right but i mean sometimes you might answer a question into the answer that you think you might want to answer to make yourself look more creatively uh superior so sometimes you know you might got get the the direct results like it's a bit like not answering a psychiatrist questions correctly because you think what you know what they want to hear not that i've ever had to do that but i imagine it's a similar mm. principle um, anyway, I suppose well, that brings us to the end. Thanks very much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, before we go, I should just quickly plug the uh, Isotope competition once more time. <laughs> if you want to win uh, Isotope's Vocal Synth, which is an excellent uh, multi-module vocal processor with vocoder and vocal shaping, harmonizing, all that sort of stuff, we're looking for the hashtag vocal tool, five vocal tools. That's the number five vocal tools. Uh, the hashtag VocalSynth2, that's the number two, to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. And if you tweet that, then uh, you'll be entered for the competition for next week. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, yeah, thank you for joining us there from your uh, your place in, Lon in London. Pleasure. I might be coming up next Monday, which um, I, I don't know if you're around, but I oh, might. Oh, let me uh, know. I let will let know. you know. Let's, I don't know where, whereabouts are, but yeah, maybe I can hook up. The girls will be shopping, and I may not enjoy the shopping quite so much and might... <laughs> might have a visit so but thank you very much for joining us joad lovely as ever and also thank you steve hillier lovely to have you are you uh, around for a bit or are you um you off um i'm off uh i think it's gonna be belgium next week i'll be around i'll be around i'll be around ah, uh, then lovely belgium, to... then it's Spain, and then it's france but yeah, i'm around Ah, right. A man of many countries. Well, thank you for joining us, Steve, as pl uh, as ever. Uh, nice to have Cheers. you. Uh, and also, uh, Mr. Charles Chicky Reeves there. Uh, are you in studio mode or are you back to hit the road again? Um, I'm hitting the road again. Uh, I have a Howard Jones show on Saturday, an OMD show on Sunday. Then we fly to Germany and we have a few shows in Germany. And then I'm back uh, for a while. I think I'm back for like a month before we head off and do some other stuff. I think we're doing like an orchestral gig. Orchestral Maneuvers is doing an orchestral gig with, you know, an orchestra. In the dark. Orchestra. All right, okay. Wow. In the dark. <laughs> but it's going to be in the dark. <laughs> and the whole so, orchestra yeah. are going to be moving around the whole time, right? Exactly. It's going to be like 4.33, <laughs> but put to music. <laughs> <laughs> Please, so, yeah. Has that, is that show there. been announced, Charles? Is that, has that orchestral show been announced? Yeah, yeah, it's with the Royal yes. Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra. It's in October. I think it's the 9th of October or something like that. Oh, that sounds fascinating. Yeah, it'll be. It, well, I've done it before. I did it with them in Shanghai, and um, I, oh, and I did it in Liverpool once with them too. So I, it's, I just, uh, it's a great show. Yeah, yeah I'd yeah. imagine it's a bit of a nightmare to mix. No, I, I have lots of experience. Where my actually my background was uh, orchestral music. That, so it's really I'm used to that sort of stuff. I used to record orchestras and I know how to mix them live, which is more about sound reinforcement than anything else. But with them, it's it's just it is a there is a blending element, but I, it's pretty easy to do, honestly. Right. They okay. think I, they think I'm a wizard, but you know, don't tell anybody. It's pretty easy. <laughs> Yeah, you just need to know what to do. Yes. yes. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this, at this point, we go to the Celebrity Squares and we say goodbye to everybody. And thank you very much for joining us for Sonic Talk, episode 545. That's it. We'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. <laughs>